Welcome to Establish the Edge. I'm your host, Mike Leone. Have a solo podcast to bring to you today. And I want to do a dynasty podcast, specifically going to be talking about startup strategy for the TriFlex Rotoviz leagues over on FFPC. Uh, if you are looking to get in a public dynasty league, you know, where you can actually win some real money and you don't want to play against your friends that think like you. I know I'm in a lot of leagues where everyone thinks the same as me and it ceases to be fun. And I want to play people that think differently because there's more, you know, it's more fun. There's more opportunities for edges. These leagues I think are really good, especially if you've been a listener to our dynasty stuff and following our ranks that Anthony Amico leads up over on Establish the Run. There's definitely some advantages to this format specifically. And I want to speak to it. If you go to FFPC, the Triflex Dynasty Leagues are on the bottom. I think the best ball ones are best, but you can do either. And the reason why I think there's an edge to be had is our rankings at Establish to Run are pretty wide receiver centric. And there's good reasons for that. The shelf lives of the players are longer. The hit rates are a bit better on wide receivers. Um, It's less volume dependent. There's less injuries at the position. So our rankings reflect that. But sometimes if you're in a regular league, that's just say it starts like two running backs, two wide receivers and a flex. It's, you know, can be difficult to fully take advantage of the fact that we're different than the market in a way that we think is correct. But there's only, it's only so far you can push at edge. If you're playing in a shallower league, the deeper the league, the more you can extend that edge. And in redraft, you know, we can extend this edge with being more invested in wide receivers by doing a zero running back or hero running back approach. And we we talk about that often in managed leagues. It's not something that I think people apply to dynasty leagues that much because there's just a different mindset. People want to build, you know, a squad that's pretty strong top to bottom. You know, that's their goal. And these triflex leagues really give you an opportunity to if, if you will, like you could go full zero running back, which kind of seems crazy. And I'll talk about why. So your starting roster spots are going to be one quarterback, two running backs, three wide receivers, which is different than other FFPC formats, one tight end. And then here's the kicker, two regular flexes and one super flex. So you're starting a lot of players. That's uh one, two, three. I'm doing math in my head right now. You're starting nine players each week. There's no kicker defense to worry about, which I also like. Um, So you're starting nine players. And I like to have five wide receivers and two quarterbacks going every week if I can. And that's pretty crazy in a super flex league to be able to start both your quarterbacks and still get scores from five wide receivers. Now we throw in the wrinkle that this is a best ball league. And you probably want eight to nine really good wide receivers to get wide receiver scores from over the course of the whole season. And I don't think most teams are going to realize that. And they're certainly not going to build that way. And it can be difficult to build that way. I mean, you only get one, one pick per round. And I don't think people realize when you're in a best ball league with deep starting rosters, how many contributing players you really want on your team. So Again, the first edge, I think, is just knowing that you can go wide receiver heavy. And if you stink at the two running back spots, I mean, think of them as instead of looking at them as like you're starting two running back spots, the mental trick I like to think is, okay, I'm starting three wide receivers, two flexes. That's five spots, two running backs. That's seven spots. Let's look at them as seven flex spots. And, you know, your two running backs happen to be flex six and flex seven is the way I, I try to look at it sometimes. And the other reason you can go full zero RB, and when I say full zero RB, I mean really not drafting a running back at all, maybe in the first 10 rounds, uh, which sounds really extreme. But again, PPR format and it's best ball scoring each week, but there are waivers in season. So now you have an opportunity to fill in your running back scores over the course of the season using waivers. There's also a lot of good values late in the draft at running back because most people are stockpiling younger talent, lottery ticket types late in the draft. So players like a James White, for example, no one's going to want to draft a James White. James White could get you 10 points a week in you know round 18 of or, or later. 
in this startup. And that's huge. I do want to mention other thing playing into being able to take those veteran wide veteran running backs late. The cut down each year goes to 16 in the off season. So if we're super deep at wide receiver, we want to keep our, you know, nine to 10 high quality wide receivers each week. We want to keep, you know, likely three quarterbacks each year. Sorry, not each week, each season. We want to keep three quarterbacks each season, keep a tight end or two. You're starting to get to 13, 14 players. You might not want to roll over a lot of running backs, but that's okay with, again, with the waivers and then with the way the rookie drafts even work, you're consistently going to be able to find usable running backs at almost no cost whatsoever. And you're just going to crush everyone at wide receiver five, you know, or that second flex spot, that first flex spot, you're going to bury them. And it's hard for people to, to figure that out. So again, the ways to accomplish this are to draft wide receiver heavy early, but also to trade down in your draft. I am in a startup right now. I've traded down a couple of times already. I did trade up at one point to get a quarterback when I got a little nervous. I traded down. I traded my first trade is I traded the 110 for a fourth round pick, a fifth round pick, and a second round pick next year. Don't put a ton of value in that second round pick next year, but that was sort of, you know, the the extra value gain I was getting on that trade. You know, most trade calculators have that first for the fourth, fifth pretty even. And again, because of the structure of this league, I think getting an extra high quality player, extra top 50 dynasty player is just massive. And by our ranks, you're definitely going to get a top 50 guy, even in that fifth round, even though it's past 50 picks at that point. Um, and then you've just got those second round picks as trade value. I did another trade. I traded a late fourth round pick for two ninth round picks in the startup and two future seconds. And same thing, you know, I'm getting an extra player this year and I'm stockpiling rookie picks, even though they're not the highest value because they're not first rounders for next year that I can use in trades again to get back in. So I think trading down is huge. One mistake I definitely made is I traded my 110 pre-draft before it started and Lamar Jackson and Kyler Murray made it there. Now, I think QB can be a little bit overrated in these formats because again, you need eight, nine wide receivers and these receivers, if you're super strong at them, they could even count for your super flex over your quarterback, but ideally you're starting two quarterbacks each week. Um, I think they can get pushed up a little bit too much because the skill players have a lot of depth, but man, it is nice to have a young elite scoring quarterback at the position. I have to worry about it. Our top four quarterbacks in our super flex rankings, our top four ranked players are all quarterbacks being Josh Allen, uh, Patrick Mahomes, Kyler Murray and Lamar Jackson, Justin Herbert. We have pretty close to there. So the fact that Kyler and Lamar made it to the 110, I was, I was trying to trade back up from the 103. I would have, you know, if I knew I was going to get those players at the 110, I might not have made the trade that I made, or I would have asked for more. So you might want to be patient before you trade that first round pick, kind of see what you can get. I think you can pass on one of those quarterbacks, but you can make people pay for it. So that's a huge thing with trading. And again, all the trades I'm making, a lot of it I'm keeping in mind, balance, depth, kind of, it's, it's like you want 13 really good players or so to, to be contributing because of the best ball scoring, but it's okay if the fringe of your roster is not super high end because you're going to have to cut down to 16 each off season anyway. So just keep in mind, you're going to be cycling those guys on the back of your roster. So um, yeah, if I'm trading down, it's generally to get more picks in the top eight rounds or so as much as possible. And then the other thing I've noticed in trades in these startup leagues, there's always a person on each side of the fence that goes into this thinking, I'm going all in. I'm going to try to win this league right away, or I'm going all in. Like I, I want Josh Allen no matter what, or there's someone that's like, oh man, that rookie class looks good next year. I'm just going to tank year one and get as many first round picks as possible. Generally, if you can catch these teams early, if you can tell that they want to go a specific direction, these teams will, they generally aren't value oriented because they have such a specific goal in mind and they're so inflexible that you can generally, if you're one of the first deals they make, it can be a really good deal, especially that team that's going all in. 
because that team that goes all in, they can only trade one future first, you know? So you want to be one of those first deals. Like at a certain point, they can't trade up any further. They just run out of assets. So you want to be one of those first few teams to catch them. I also think getting a future first from a team that's trading up multiple times and condensing their roster, they're going to have these elite studs, but they're going to get killed on depth throughout the season. So it's this rare opportunity in a startup where the team that goes all in might not have a top three roster and you can really benefit, you know, from potentially getting a really valuable first right away, right off the bat. So that is something to absolutely keep in mind. Um, again, quarterback, I think is a little overrated, but it's, it's tough to figure. I'm in the mid rounds in when I say mid rounds, I mean like fifth, sixth round, I'm generally trying to just hammer wide receiver the fifth, sixth round seem really deep at wide receiver. You know, I'm currently in a startup where I took Marquise Brown and Jerry Judy mid late fifth, hoping to get Devonta Smith or Rashad Bateman in the sixth. I think it's going to happen. That's good by our rankings. We've got DJ Moore in the fourth. So uh, these receivers can slip. And a quarterback, what I did, where I did panic a little bit, was going into the fifth. Zach Wilson uh, was basically the last quarterback that had any youth to him available. So I did make a trade up at a certain point to ensure that I got Zach Wilson in the fifth round. I'm currently through five rounds of my draft. I'll show you, I'll show you guys what I have um, through five rounds. You can sort of see how this is done. I have Zach Wilson, DJ Moore, Marquise Brown, Jerry Judy, and CD Lamb on my team. I took CD Lamb at the 203. I took DJ Moore at the 403. I took Zach Wilson, Judy, Marquise Brown, all in the middle of the fifth round. So I have five players through five, but what I also have in terms of extra value, I have an extra seventh round pick. I have an extra ninth round pick and I have four future seconds on my team. So once we get through, you know, the first 10 rounds of the draft, I'm going to have 12 players. I'm going to have two more players than anybody else, which is going to be huge, especially, you know, the quality of players is going to start to drop off somewhat steeply. So that's big. I also have all these future seconds I can save for later trade value or maybe trade back in. You know, ideally I'd like to have 13 players through 10 rounds. Uh, in this sixth round that I'm in right now, I only have one pick in the sixth. I'll probably try and trade a first if I can get both Bateman and Devonta Smith and just really load up on wide receivers. It's probably the last guys I would trade a future first for, but I am open to trading my future first. It's a strategy that Pat Crane got me on, which I think makes a lot of sense, where you aren't going all in in the sense that you're still building super young and you've got longevity in mind. But you're sort of banking uh, a, a player for a full season. You know, ideally, whether it's Bateman or Devonta Smith, I'm able to trade in the sixth round four with a first. Potentially, I don't know if it'll happen. Those guys might be worth a first in a year out. So I, I've got in a free rental year, um, which is really big. So I do like kind of the all in with a really young team that's going to last for a long time. So that gives you some idea of a startup I'm in right now. I will show you a team I did last year that did really well. Humble brag on this team, but just to show you how this strategy can work out, I won this league. And again, I mentioned quarterback being overrated. I won this league with, um, with Mac Jones, Zach Wilson, and Ben Roethlisberger, a quarterback in a super flex league last year. The reason I was able to do that I could bring up last season. I don't think it lets me bring up last season. But if you look at running back, I was able to take some chances late. I drafted Rashad Penny, Elijah Mitchell late because I'm just loading up in a full zero RB, taking them late. So those were lucky but huge wins. You can see at wide receiver, though, I was able to just go absolutely ham at wide receiver because I traded down so much. Took DJ Moore, Debo Samuel, Cooper Cup, Jerry Judy, Brandon Ayuk, Stefan Diggs, Michael Thomas. Tyler Boyd, Jalen Waddle, Rashad Bateman. Like I just smash wide receivers, getting as many picks as possible in like rounds five through nine. You know, Cooper Cup and Debo Samuel last year weren't going that early. They were like eighth round picks, I think. 
and I took George Kittle at tight end. He was my, I think my premium pick, my second rounder last year was taking Kittle. Everything else uh, I've traded down. I don't think I had another pick until the fourth round last season. So um, that's, that's in way this strategy can work. So now, of course, I got super, super lucky that Cup and Debo hit in such a huge way. But that almost covered me where I think there were some weeks I probably didn't use a second quarterback in my lineup. And I had three pretty bad quarterbacks playing. And um, it was okay because I was just so incredibly deep at wide receiver. These teams were scoring each week. And again, the best ball scoring, massive, massive to have that depth. Um, last thing I want to hit on here, quarterback position is, is difficult. Again, I've had the mindset the last couple seasons in startups where I've skimped on quarterback a little bit to be so good elsewhere. And it's a strategy that helps you win right away because the price that people are paying for the elite quarterbacks is generally one taking into account their longevity. So they're not necessarily seeing that return on value immediately. I will say in some of those leagues, where a couple of seasons ago, I took Matt Ryan, you know, I took, um, you know, I've just got some weaker quarterbacks of that nature where I had teams where I had four or five quarterbacks that were starting that are down to, you know, one and a half starters now. And that starter might be Matt Ryan, who's on his last legs. And you do increase your ability to win right now, but you also can end up in trouble in a couple of years. And it's trouble that's hard to get out of. It can be difficult to acquire quarterbacks, especially if you're in this spot where your team has been good. You don't really have good picks. You've maybe gone all in. And the price tags and the trade market on quarterbacks can be inflated in these super flex leagues. So I am a lot more willing than I think I have been in the past to maybe try and get one really strong quarterback. I think in these triflex leagues, if you're getting two super high end quarterbacks, you're probably overpaying for it and you're not getting the value you think given the required depth at wide receiver to do really well in these leagues. But I think if you can get one, again, I'm certainly kicking myself for trading that 110 that I did. I would have gladly taken Lamar or Kyler there and you know tried to trade down maybe more aggressively with my second, third, fourth round picks to make up for and get my extra players that way. Maybe trade my future first to get an extra player in that mid tier. So I hope this was helpful. It's kind of walking through how I think about these leagues. Again, I think it's a pretty unique opportunity just because there aren't a ton of leagues where in dynasty startups, you can go full zero running back with so much success. And this one, you are uniquely situation to do that because you need eight to nine high quality wide receivers. You only need two running back scores a week. You have waivers in season and the offseason cut down is to 16 guys. So instead of stashing young guys up and down throughout your roster, you know, with your picks, you know, 16 through 20, you can start taking really boring contributors at running back. And then a couple of dart throws. Like I took Elijah Mitchell last year. Luckily, that worked out. I also took you know some guys that completely flamed out, but waiver period. Can I drop those pretty easily? Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We'll be back. Next week, I'm going to have Eric Bime for on the show to talk about Best Ball Mania 3 on Underdog. We did a great episode last season, um, kind of galaxy brain thinking how to win that tournament. So this one will be a little bit more specific strategy wise than the one I did with Justin Herzig, which you haven't listened to is a great primer on getting ready for Best Ball Mania 3. And then two weeks out from now, I'm going to have Jack Miller on who's done some great work on us on, on ETR for us. Uh, he's just did an article looking at underdog win rates based on running back strategies. And he really took the time to dive into the context of player performances to explain those so that we don't overreact and really understand why the win rates of certain running back strategies occurred. And I'm excited to talk to him somewhat about that article and extending from it, the running back dead zone, which was God awful last year, somewhat predictably, uh, except for some of us who took Mike Davis now and then raised his hand. But this year, I think it could be different, and I want to get Jack's thoughts on that. All right, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Hope you have a great day.